All right, everybody. Um, we're. I uh, hope you guys have uh, enjoyed your your break. I don't know if, if uh, how many of you guys are on campus, uh, but we've missed. Uh, it's, it's hard to believe we've already had two uh, snow weeks, uh, yeah, back to back, and uh, missed almost a whole week again this week. Uh, last time I went to class was Monday. Uh, so I don't know how your other professors work with you online. I guess you, that's one of the misfortunes is that you, you're you already at uh, your educational post by being at home. Uh, but anyway, I hope you're enjoying that or will enjoy watching uh, that video. People Like Us is one of my favorites, one of my uh, students' uh, favorite uh, films as well. Uh, quite informative about uh, the culture of social class as well as humorous. So uh, I hope you uh, have time, at least maybe this weekend, to watch that. Um, but anyway, we're looking at uh, we're, we're going to be looking at uh, chapter uh, four on on social interaction, and uh, there's a couple of running uh, uh, themes uh, in this chapter that I want to touch base with, tie it together for you. Uh, and uh, main, mainly this chapter is about uh, social structures, social status, playing social roles, and then talking about dramaturgy. Uh, so that's where I want to go. Uh, the first uh, the chapter, first four chapters kind of deal with the ways in which individuals are, and the ways in which uh, the individual and society uh, meet, if you will. Uh, so, you know, how we become social selves is a major theme running through those four chapters. Um, so, uh, we've looked at uh, we've looked at interaction. I'm sorry, we've looked at uh, social, so, socialization, culture, and uh, that whole process of bringing the individual or, or bringing the generalized other society within the individual. Uh, and this chapter uh, kind of puts all that in, into a, a, a closer context, if you will. Uh, where does uh, socialization take place? And uh, it's not just in a, a void. There's actually a, a cultural structure to how we interact with each other. And in the chapter, they, the chapter talks about uh, social structure. Social structures are two or more statuses uh, that have been designed by our culture uh, before we arrive on the scene and after we leave. Those social think of going back to chapter one. Think of uh, social structures as social facts that exist in society. We come along. We enter into the social statuses. Uh, and again, a social structure is two or more statuses. Uh, I, I twist the definition a little bit, uh, regardless of the personalities involved. It doesn't matter about who's involved in terms of our personal biographies. It's the it's how the structure of the social statuses have been structured into the social structure and informed by the society or the culture's uh, role stat, the roles, social roles those cultural expectations tied to the statuses that we occupy. And a social status is a position that we take up. It's actually a slot, if you will. Think of uh, an organization, a business, and they have certain slots for employers to come in and take take a position. Just like at your work, uh, at my work, you know, they have, we have openings for professors. That's a status. Uh, and it's in within a social structure with uh, a host of others, actually. But if you think of the if you think of the instructor student uh, social structure, it was there before we came along, and uh, it'll be there when we leave. And it's pretty much transferred from one classroom to the next. You can take one class of students and and, and replace them with another set, take another instructor and place them in the classroom, and it'll pretty much run. There, there's certainly personalities involved in how we present, uh, you know. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, about what we call dis role distancing. Uh, but we all pretty much uh, would recognize a classroom because of how the social structure 
that has uh, structured the social statuses in terms of their role requirements, role expectations. Uh, but that first part, I always tell students that the first, uh, that first part about social structure, social status is quite abstract and necessarily so because we can do a lot of different studies in different group settings uh, in terms of analyzing a social structure. Uh, but then when we move to dramaturgy, it becomes a little bit more down to earth uh, and is meant so by the theorist uh, Goffman, Irving Goffman. Uh, he presents uh, the social status, uh, social structure, uh, abstract theoretical uh, con constructs, if you will. He brings it down more to earth and talks about it in terms of real people, and everyday people, and dramaturgy. How do we really play out our roles in, in uh, the various situations that we're in? It's, it's highly related to, you can think of the theory about uh, social structure, social status, social roles up here. Uh, above, flying, flying above, a social fact, right? It's above the heads of the people working behind it's the little little old, uh, little man working the the great and powerful odds and the little behind the curtain, right? And then he brings it down to the everyday level where we're interacting, and he uses his concepts, his theory of uh, dramaturgy to show how we manage our impressions, how we try to put our best foot forward in any sit public situation. So we'll address that in just a second. Uh, the first, the, the chapter starts out by looking at uh, a very broad macro historical level. Looking at, um, he distinguishes between two two different types of uh, interactive uh, societies, ways of social interaction, in terms of two uh, different historical epochs, if you will. One is traditional society, and then with industrialization, it's industrial and post-industrial society. And it looks at the forms of social interaction that took place within them, kinds of statuses within them. So just, just briefly, uh, it's, it's really a dichotomy. Uh, again, here's a case of, uh, of sociology using two concepts diametrically opposed in order to make comparisons. And so in this scenario, then on page uh, uh, 121, on page 121, we have uh, mechanical solidarity and organic solidarity. Uh, and uh, this was uh, developed by a sociologist by the name of a German sociologist, Turnies. Uh, but just to step back just real quick before we, 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 we touch base with that, uh, the book starts out saying, you know, the, the Durkheim said traditional societies pre uh, industrial modernized urban societies. The traditional societies are the more agricultural type societies, smaller villages, and uh, social change was slower. Um, people didn't move from one place to, to the other as much. Families st tended to stay together over generations, the extended family networks. He said that this uh, pre traditional form of uh, community, if you will, uh, was based on what he called uh, a kind of interaction that's, that's based on sameness. That is that the the interaction, social interaction among people in the community was based on familiarity with each other and sameness. Uh, simple division of labor, as you read there, simple is based on a simple division of labor, usually based on gender lines and homogeneous statuses. What that means is that uh, men tended to be all farmers, for example, just one status. Uh, the uh, females, women tended to uh, take care of the home, children, and, and uh, other things around the farm, if you will. Uh, but in both cases, the, the statuses, it's not a, a complex hierarchy of occupational statuses or scales, uh, occupational levels, for example, like we have today. So there's a few statuses, simple division of labor between, generally based along gender lines. And in those kinds of community, of course, we, you can think of uh, uh, something comparable in our society even today would be like uh, rural communities, small towns, uh, have this sort of social order where people base their... Uh, 
their interaction with each other is based on similarities, on, on not on differences from each other, but how much we are alike. So uh, in that situation, then people know each other, uh, know each other's biographies, they know the histories of, of, they don't know you, they may know your family and your family name. Uh, the community knows every, you know, this whole thing about everybody knows everybody else. Uh, emotional ties, long lasting, you know, bonding. Uh, the old community that uh, Durkheim was really favorable of, of preserving. Uh, but he said that the interaction is based on people's similarity. Similarity not only in terms of how they look or dress, but also similarities in terms of their values, their norms and beliefs. Quite homogeneous, uh, meaning they're all the same. And then on the other side, in the uh, after industrial, after the industrial revolution, you have uh, modern industrialized capitalist societies. Uh, now the division of labor is complex. You have an array hierarchy of occupations, for example. Uh, people are, are uh, the uh, social interaction is based on differences from each other. It's not based on sameness. So differences is the, is the uh, key word for modern uh, capitalist uh, urban societies. Uh, we all uh, tend to be different from each other in many ways uh, because of that complex division of labor. In the traditional society, uh, a person like it could be a uh, jack of all trades. You did everything in the on the farm, made your own clothes, food. You, you know, the, the uh, informally people would uh, police their communities, and, uh, settle uh, conflicts in the community. Very, uh, uh, very organic kind of. Um, shouldn't use organic because that's one of the terms. It's very mechanical type of uh, type of so solidarity, but with the with the uh, complex division of labor, we, we have all these differences. So, so Durkheim asked the question: There's so many differences between us. How do we? How does uh, a complex society like ours? How does it? Uh, how does it reproduce order in the in the society? You know, there's certainly conflicts and there's problems every day, but uh, on kill, the uh, the society tends to run smoothly. Right, there tends to be an ordering. And that's about it. even though there's a society here made up mainly of strangers over so many millions and millions of people, hundreds of millions of people that don't, don't even know each other. How can we keep uh, order and stability in that society? Well, uh, Durkheim said that uh, that uh, one of his concerns, you know, well, of the time period, like with Marx, for example, thought, well, this society is going to collapse. It's got too much tension, too many uh, conflicts. Durkheim said, no, it can, it can run smoothly because there is a different kind of solidarity. So he's looking at two different kinds, one based on sameness. The other solidarity among us is based on our differences from each other. And so he said that these differences were so, since we weren't jack-of-all-trades, since we were all doing our little thing, you know, like so... While you're going to university to get a four-year degree, you can't make your own clothes, uh, police your community, doctor, you know, you can't be out doctoring others, and you don't have enough time, you know, to think about taking a, to getting a four-year degree, how much time limits you have. So we all have all these different uh, things we're specializing in, and uh, but at the same time, you know, we've lost all that ability to do so many other things. Uh, we don't. We can't grow our own food. We don't grow our own food. We don't tend to build our own homes. We don't tend to doctor ourselves. You know, we go to doctors for our health. We have uh, formalized police. We have garbage uh, collectors. You name it. Go down the line. You know, car mechanics. Uh, everybody else is doing their one or two things that they specialize in. But in the end, it's our interdependence with each other, he says. With with this difference is what, what, what produces a new solidarity, if you will. Not based on the old community model of sameness, but based on differences is interdependence. We're inter interdependent upon each other for our very survival. And because of that, it produces a, a kind of uh, order. And then... Uh, 
attorneys kind of touch his base with uh, Emil Durkheim in this matter. He he says there's two types of uh, two types of solidarities uh, um, on the, in, in relation to these two historical uh, social types, ideal types, if you will, with, with uh, uh, these two ideal types of societies that we can use to make comparisons. Uh, one is mechanical solidarity, and the other is organic. Don't get these confused. They're they're simple concepts, but they're they're easy to get confused on a test. So make sure you keep these straight. But mechanical solidarity is characteristics of a social order based on a common conscience, going back to this uniformity of thinking and behavior. In this situation, a person's first duty is to resemble everybody else. Uh, this is your face-to-face -face small community based on face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's emotionally bonding, long-lasting uh, generations upon generations of folks within these communities. They know each other very well. Uh, so this is called mechanical solidarity. And this solidarity, as Durkheim would say, is based on sameness, being the same. Everybody's got the same value, uniform thinking. People, everybody thinks you, you know what this is. Uh, you know, especially if you grew up in a small town, you already know this. So uh, maybe it doesn't fit the ideal type. Not, no society does, but it doesn't fit the ideal type. But it, but it compares compares to it. It has some characteristic features of it. And uh, so uh, you know the stereotypes of the small town. There, everybody thinks alike. Everybody dresses alike. Everybody uh, has the same values. There's not a lot of uh, not a lot of differences. Uh, no surprises, if you will. And this is where we get this notion of small towns being boring, right? No color. Not a lot of lively uh, characters of different backgrounds, different uh, ways of doing things, uh, different outlooks. Uh, to have those differences for a, a community and mechanical solidarity type society, differences are are, are seen as bad, right? If a person's in a small town, you've heard of people in a small town who they don't fit in with the with the with the groups in the small town because they have uh, outside reference groups, and uh, so that they're uh, maybe they have bizarre beliefs, and maybe not bizarre, maybe they just have different beliefs, religiously and politically, you know, even dress styles and whatnot, and so for that person, they they may feel rejected by the community because. They're rejecting the community by not by not wanting to think and feel and do things like everybody else does in the community. That's mechanical solidarity, and it fits the it fits the older traditional form of community where everybody is alike. Organic solidarity is a society of complex division of labor, as we were saying. Uh, it's characterized by organic solidarity. It's a social order based on interdependence and cooperation among people performing a wide range of diverse and specialized tasks. A complex division of labor increases differences among people, in turn leading, in turn leading to a decrease in common consciousness. However, as Durkheim argued, the ties that bind people to one another based on specialization and interdependence can be very strong. And uh, for our purposes, moving towards looking at social structure and uh, looking at social statuses and social roles, this movement from a mechan from a uh, mechanical type solidarity based on you know a few people knowing each other, sameness, over to a very complex uh, division of labor based on organic solidarity. Solidarity. One of the mechanisms through which we're able to simplify our lives in a very complex society like ours is to base our uh, social interaction with others, especially strangers, uh, on the statuses they occupy. Because think about it, if you had to gay, let's say you get stopped by, by a cop or you get stopped by a highway patrol on the highway, every time they you get stopped, every time you have to make a judgment about the... Uh, this person that's coming up to your car with a gun on their side, whether to trust them or not, or what can you bank your social interaction on? 
well, in a complex society like ours, where we don't know the person, nine times out of ten, you're not going to know who that highway patrolman is or person is. Uh, we bank it on the status they occupy, not their biography, as in the case of the older type of community. It's not that, oh, that's uh, so-and-so's son, so I know that family, I know they're good people, blah, blah. No, we base a lot of our social interaction based on social statuses. So as I say, you don't have to know the personality, particular uh, person involved in the status. We just have to know what the status is, and especially the, the role requirement, requirements of that role. What is, what is a professor supposed to do in a classroom? What is a uh, highway patrol person, what are they supposed to do when they stop you? How are they supposed to act towards you? How are you supposed to act towards them? That's the social roles attached to these statuses, regardless of the people involved. That's a great example of a social fact. Uh, it's there, and we, we're socialized to learn about those. Remember the role-taking and playing the roles of the kids, playing roles of different others. So, it's very closely uh, knitted together, these uh, concepts, these series. Uh, so let's walk in on in then from this then uh, let's look at uh, social statuses social st let me say in one sentence I can tie this all together there's quite a couple of pages there that deal with these but I can put it together in one sentence so here's the sentence and you can write this down it'll help you uh, study it study these concepts uh, a social structure, I'm sorry, a social status, you can put an underline under social status, a social status is a position within a social structure, you can draw a line under social structure, that's the next concept, in which we enact roles. So let's do that again. That's the sentence that takes care of it, basically. A social status is a position that we take up, right? So a social status is a position within a social structure in which we enact roles. So a social structure is two or more statuses that have been structured, socially structured, meaning that it was structured by the, the culture. Let's use the classroom, in, in, for example. The social structure between instructor and students uh, has been structured by the institution of education. It's been there a long time. Uh, and so this is something that's been, the, the interaction between these statuses has been uh, structured long before you and I ever even came along. And then within the social structure, the two social statuses, instructor or professor and students, the, the, uh, the, the um, social roles, the roles are the norms the expectations attached to that status. And those role expectations were created by, by the institution of education in our culture. It can vary in other cultures, uh, especially the role requirements, the expectations. Uh, so it's put in place, there it is. And then you can just put in uh, Students on one side, an instructor, it doesn't matter who they are, and then they learn about, of course, been, we've been learning this since grade school. We learn about that status, and then we learn through learning about the, the, uh, the, uh, the role expectations. And we internalize the role expectations, and then when we conform to those role expectations, then our interaction becomes smooth. So much so that even in the class, even in this position, but it, let's say even in our class, we don't know each other. Let's say you didn't know my name, I didn't know your name. We could still do the course. It would be kind of dry, but we could still, and impersonal, but we could still do the course uh, simply by the role requirements. Because if you look at the role requirements attached to any statuses, it's a t usually a two-way street. So from instructor to student, the role requirements, the expectations, are based upon rights and obligations. So those social roles, we learn through social, being socialized into our statuses. What, is the, what are my rights in this position? A lot of times, 
even you know your student handbook uh, if you're working for a company they'll have your employee do's and don'ts you have to learn those those are the the rights and obligations attached to your status and those rights and obligations generally work in a two, on a two-way street so for example uh, I as your professor uh, one of my rights is that my students my rights become my rights become your obligations your rights become my obligations so one of my rights would be things like uh, that you uh, listen to these videos you study each week, read your chapters, read your readings, go, especially go to the discussion board, show me that you're alive and that you're with me, with us in the class. And uh, take your test during the t test time. And um, so that's something I can expect from you, to, you know, to, to honor the honor codes and no plagiarism, no cheating on exams. Those are my rights and as my expectations. That's your obligations. Now, your rights are my obligations. So you have a right for me to, for example, if I tell you we're having a uh, uh, multiple choice true false test and that uh, I've given you 30 minutes to take, I've given you an hour and 10 minutes to take it, and then come test time I have an all essay question exam and I'm only going to give you 30 minutes. That would be going against your rights as a student because in some ways you've been tricked into uh, you know, not knowing what to expect, or I have failed to follow the syllabus uh, in certain forms. Though, though we do, we can change it tentatively, like when we have certain weather situations, or if I feel like uh, we need to slow down or speed up. Uh, but in general, I try to follow the syllabus, uh, and that syllabus sort of reflects uh, our our roles, our rights, and obligations to each other. So I, you have a right for me to to be here on every week to engage you to. Uh, do things like this video, you know, to do my best in trying to uh, give you the material and help, help, help you to understand the concepts. That's uh, your rights. That's my obligations. So you can see there that they're not personal, though. Though we may personalize them, we embody them. That's one of the things about playing social roles. We have these social scripts that we play out with each other. And... Uh, you know, social structure governs. If you can, if one way you can, one thing you can do with about your with your uh, with your own uh, background, a life, is uh, you can take a piece of paper, draw a big circle, and then draw out these little like a wagon wheel, little spokes, and then at the end of the spokes, put some little put a little circle. And so you got this. What what we're what you're constructing would be what's called your your that your uh, your uh, status set and you could look at each status that you're involved in in your life at this point in time and write those in so one, one status would be a student another status might be a girlfriend a boyfriend or husband and wife another might be uh, I play on a volleyball team another might be that I'm a mother or another might be I'm, an, I'm employed or I'm an employee uh, another might be I'm a church member, another might be I'm a band member, then there's a friendship group I belong to, an exercise club, you can go all the way around your self, put self in the the, the circle in the middle, put right self, those statuses around on those spokes, uh, that, would, that would define yourself, you can think about it, you can analyze it. Also, a concept of role conflict comes in. Uh, when we're playing out statuses, that, that the more complex our status set, the more uh, the less we're able to uh, to manage our time or free to have uh, the ability to manipulate time so much because we don't have any time. We have so much on on the back burner, so to speak, that. Uh, our status has come into conflict. So being the best student you can be requires you to do a lot of late night studying, for example. Yet you gotta get up early in the morning and go to work that you may let down on your obligations at work. You may uh, try to do your best at both of those and let down on your obligations as a parent. That's called role comp. All of us experience that sometime or another. Also, these statuses also change through time. They don't always remain the same. Uh, as we go through life, we drop some statuses and gain others. Uh, 
step into new statuses. Uh, but I want to uh, move now towards talking about dramaturgy, and I'm going to start another. Uh, go ahead now and start a new uh, a new video. So just hold on. Go to go to part two.